Hello, everyone, and welcome to Learning from Friends. This is the debut of season two, episode one. And for longtime listeners, you might be hearing this voice and thinking to yourself, Cade sounds a little different today. Well, I, Chris Bias, will be your host for today for a very special occasion. We're having a bit of a role reversal. This is the one-year anniversary episode of Learning from Friends, and as much as our faithful host Cade has interviewed and talked with so many other peoples and discovered their stories, we thought it might be best to turn the tables. So our guest today is the man himself, Cade Curtis. Now, before we get into that, I do want to read Cade's mom's quote of the day. The simple life. Missing somebody? Call. Call. Want to be understood? Explain. Have questions? Ask. Don't like something? Say it nicely. Like something? Declare it. Want something? Ask for it. Stressed? Let go. Love someone? Say it. Now on to our topic of the day, the man himself, Cade. Cade, you are now sitting on the other side of the proverbial table. You are in the guest spot. This is weird. I'm going to be honest with you. I've been nervous about this all week. And ever since I came up with the idea about five, six months ago, I was like, okay, it's got to be Chris. Chris was the first episode. I got to go backwards and do this. I've, I've been nervous and finally getting here, especially at a one year mark. I didn't think I was actually going to make it to one year. So I'm like, I'm impressed with this, but, uh, Oh, let's see how this goes. Thank you. Hey, Chris, thank you for having me on the podcast today. Oh, hey, hey, my pleasure. You know, I put a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears into this podcast, so I'm just really happy that I can get someone of your caliber on. It is a reminder, Kate just said it, I was the initial guest on the first episode, and he told me many months ago that, you know, at some point, maybe for the one year, we should we should do a little swap, right? You should interview me. And when he says he's nervous, trust me, he's correct on that because he sent me about eight text messages during the week, some of which is completely necessary because while Kate is the get prepared sort of guy, I am the I'm going to wait to the very last moment sort of guy. We're kind of the two sides of the same coin. True statement. But here we are. We made it. And uh, I am so excited to get to to be on this side and, and talk to our man Cade today. And, you know, I'm sure that people have learned a bit of you considering all that you've done on this podcast over the last year. But I have to imagine that there's so much more they want to know. I mean, you might be a mysterious host to everybody else, and I want to dive into that story. And the first thing that comes to my mind is about this podcast itself. Uh, You know, you told me years ago that this was something you were interested in doing. But I guess the question is why? What was the drive to start a podcast like this where you are interviewing people locally and just about their lives, right, about their experiences. I know we've previously discussed that most people want to just get bigger and bigger and interview people with more name value, but your interest is on local, relatable stories. That's a that's a true statement because uh, there's no podcast out there for the common man. Like I constantly, when I got into listening to podcasts, was, oh, as you said, here's a celebrity, here's the big name of somebody, that's coming on the podcast, and here's the professional. And I go, there's the common man that has a great story, that has something to say, and could really teach us, but also at the same time, give us a different perspective of not being a necessary professional level, like top tier of their field, but something basic that we would have overlooked and never thought about. And I grew up with my family constantly telling stories, exchanging things back and forth. And for me, that was just kind of second nature. I've recorded people over the years just doing general conversations with my family, kind of collecting a little bit of genealogy, which I've had several family members that have done that, but we don't have anything of audio. So I was like, I want to do this audio. But I was looking backwards specifically for one moment where everything changed, where I started doing this kind of process of asking these questions was my brother was doing a interview for Veterans Day. And I have an uncle, Albert, great uncle Albert, who was in World War II. And, you know, he agreed to come and do a podcast, not podcast, but do an interview. And I want to say I'm in elementary school at this time. And we sit down and Corey's talking to him. They're going through the process. My dad's there as well. And as we're going through this, he starts opening up and telling this elaborate story. And he has some other family members there. 
and their eyes are just getting big and they're coming in and really sitting and listening. And as it wraps up and we finish, a couple of the family members come over and goes, we've never heard that story. For me, that was like a aha moment of, holy moly, everybody kind of has a little story inside of them. And that's, I see. It, it, it stuck with me. Interesting. Like, it totally did. I, I never knew that. That makes sense, right? That you could have such a dramatic story for someone that you would never expect it. Yeah. Mm. Well, speaking of uh, dramatic stories, maybe not so dramatic, but first, before we dive in further, I did just realize that on almost every podcast you do, you ask your guests to sum themselves up, right? If you could paint a picture of yourself. And so just as you do to your guest, I'm going to do to you, my guest. So, (laughs) hey, Curtis, who are you? Paint our fair listeners a picture of who their faithful, loyal host is. I will say that I'm like, you know, buff as can be. I've got muscles on top of muscles. He's massive. (laughs) If he's telling the truth, he's gotten huge. Uh, I think he's got a few bodybuilding competitions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, you know, Uh I'm all about 260 pounds, six foot, like two just muscly ribs. You're being modest. It's bigger than that. You know, that's fine. Um, that, that, that's, that's be real. I'm like tiny, like being pulled, like all of like 5'11 and like 135 pounds. Hey, there's wet. nothing wrong with being but, 5'11. Oh, no, okay. no, nothing wrong with that. But to really paint you a picture of really who I am, I'm really like a nurturer to the point of kind of being self, you know, detrimental at times. I always put others ahead of me because if I, I like others to be at ease and comfortable because that makes me feel better. I always question myself. I'm a questioner. And a lot of the times, which makes me a little bit of a worrier, and that's okay because of it. it's always been, I always felt like I was a little bit of like a glue for people to keep us always together. And because of that, I was always a planner. That's just something that I always put together here. And with all of those of being questioning and nurturing and putting others ahead of me, I consider myself really a giver because I'll give everything away, including the shirt off my back if someone needs it in order to make sure that they're happy, they're healthy. And one thing that kind of comes up a lot is I like to do so many different things. I call myself a master of none. <laughs> it's, that makes the, sense. Yeah. I've never heard you say it, but now that you say it out loud, I yeah. completely understand what you're saying. Yeah, it's a master of none, but the curiosity of many. And most of all, I like to consider myself a little bit of an artist, like a story collector, because I always find these people, I find these places, and it's so interesting to me to find meaning behind something. And that, I think, to me, is a picture of myself. Mm, I see. I'm going to turn it back as being the interviewer person. What do you see, Chris, as, as me? Because we've known each other, as we mentioned in the first podcast, I think it's been 27 years. 27 years, yeah. If not a little longer. years. You know, that is a great question. And when you think about it, it's so difficult to distill someone down to just, you know, a few words, right, without a lot of thought. The first thing that came to my mind, though, when you said that wasn't actually a description, it was art. And I'll explain, (laughs) you know, for most people, if we might draw a picture of them, it'd be, I don't know, neoclassical, just they would look like themselves or something similar, like a realistic painting. You make me think of more of a, a Jackson Pollock yes, style. Yes, I was so hoping for that. Yes, absolutely, right? There's there's, there's dashes of, of colors everywhere and different patterns, right? And it's expressive. Even though it isn't any particular shape necessarily, there's just expression there. And people are often drawn to it, right? And I feel like you have that sort of energy where people are often drawn to you. So a Jackson Pollock painting. Wow. I, I love that. And there's so many like bajillion layers that he has and it takes him for years and years to kind of be painted. Yeah. That's honoring. Hey, I, man. Ha- happy to bestow it, good sir. Happy man. to bestow it. I don't even know what to say fully than that. Gosh. <laughs> well, something you had just mentioned, you talked about exploring places, people, things of that sort. And I think it's clear to anyone that knows you or has listened to this podcast that relationships are important to you. I mean, here you are on this podcast talking to people, forming relationships just about themselves. And anyone that knows Cade knows that he pulls people in. I mean, our (laughs) our friends group who are known as the Nightcrawlers, uh, Cade has recruited at least like half of us. Um, The joke is often that he picks up strays, but relationships matter to him. And I'm curious, why would you say that is? I mean, relationships are important to everyone, but clearly they're 
really important to you in life. Do you have any idea of why you feel so strongly connected to others in this manner? Because on the flip side, I'm someone that can be hard as heck to get a hold of, right? I'm like the Loch Ness Monster. It's so true. You're hard to get a hold of. I pop up every once in a while and then I disappear, right? But you are, you're the opposite. You anchor people and pull them in. Why, why is there such a draw? Well, you're born into a family. That's, you know, that's bloodline. That's kind of who you are, that whole entire creation there. But you get to choose your friends. You get to create that bond. And that to me is my other family. Mm, And not trying to talk negative towards anybody, but I am more close to my friends that I've created and bonded because I see you guys more often. I went to school with you. Sure, We sure. live together. We dealt the stuff. And to that, to me, in order to keep that bond in place, you have to invest your time, invest that something into mm-hmm. it. Sure. And to be real with somebody goes a long way. And a relationship mm-hmm. to me is I consider everybody in the group, my brother, my sisters. And you tell your brothers and your sisters everything. And so I always try to be open with everybody, which can be self detrimental at times, <laughs> which can scare some people away. But at the same time, you build that trust with somebody. And that's that relationship that comes up there. And I always want to treat somebody the same way that I want to be treated. Mm, sure. Because that just, it sends that signal back and forth. And when you, everybody brings something to the table, everybody does. And that's the cool thing about our group is that tight group. We have different backgrounds in terms of some of us live in cities, some of us in rural rural areas, some of our different ethnicities, some of us are a little older, some of us are a little younger, some of us went to college, some didn't go to college, and we're different fields of jobs and stuff. So Mm -hmm, it's just fun to see that. And I, I always hated to see people suffer. And I know that sounds really strange of like, but people suffer every day. Yeah, they do. But that's why it's kind of going on picking up strays. I see somebody that may be sitting by themselves or I see somebody that is just having kind of that bad day and I'll walk up, I'll strike up a conversation. And next thing you know, like 10 years later, they're still hanging out with us. I mean, that's a true story, by the way, that that actually happened. Uh, I won't name anyone in case they don't want to be named, but that is definitely how one member of our friends group was recruited. Oh, entirely. And I come by this honesty of being able to talk to people. My dad would talk to a brick wall. If this <laughs> how much communications he didn't have he didn't have a person that wasn't a friend or didn't know in some acquaintance in some way. So I just kind of come by that honestly. And now as I get older, my mom's become that person and she'll talk to anybody and direct strike up this whole conversation. So it's just kind of been continual of of this. So I consider, you know, I'll always meet a friend somewhere. Okay, okay. No, and just in case he hasn't mentioned this before on the podcast, and I doubt he has, but there is definitely a period of time, I feel like, maybe post-college, it's hard to say, but when everyone's growing up and you start to go off, you start to do your thing, right? That Cade just was the glue to our friends group and just refused to let everybody break apart. He was like, no, this is not happening. We are not doing this. You are all staying here. And I'm thrilled that he did, but absolutely, absolutely the glue. Uh, that keeps relationships going, which is great because we're still doing this podcast. It so, is true. There and you go. we have, we've done group troops together, troops, group trips together yes. where we've gone like Colorado. Yes. You and me and Corey went to Iceland last we year, did. which is funny. We talked about that on the first episode before we left. And so that's just kind of ironic because we left in on Thanksgiving. Goodness, I didn't realize yeah. that. We did, we did, yes. And then we've done, like, we've gone and watched wrestling events together because that's yep. a big bond for us. Yep. We've gone to different states, like, going to see concerts and stuff. That's just bonding. Like, yep. that's just part of it, and that's the way to do it. And we used to do poker nights. We used to yep, do that's right. all these different little things together. And that was my planning, my, like, whole idea, trying to be able to keep people together that way. Sure. Hey, and side note, but you know what can test your bond is when you're – rent a car in Eisen breaks down at 6 a.m. and you have to stop at a bakery and uh, try to make a phone call and speak to someone in Iceland because that is exactly what happened to us on the beginning of the trip. But we persevered. We and, did. And we are still here. And I, I blame Corey, if you're listening. I blame you <laughs> for having that issue because you, you always have to say, well, something bad happens to me at every trip I go to. And you curse it because the moment we got off that plane and got into the car, like we made it. And, and I'm driving the car and it's like, Okay, speed up. I'm like, I, I can't. Like my, my foot's oh, like man. floored and it's not doing anything. Oh, man. And the ironic part is the guy showed up, got in the car, and just drove off. I'm like, 
what happened? Hey, you know, as long as he can make it back, I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, because it was pitch black, though. Now that you've invoked Corey's name, uh, we've already started a conflict in the future. This is my fault. I shouldn't have done it's this. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. That's part of, I always call out someone in my family uh, as we're going through the podcast. Oh, okay, great. So it's well, always then, fun. Corey. Corey is the call out of the day. We'll make yep. that official. Call out of the day. Corey Curtis. Uh. Hey. Okay. Well, in relation to relationships in the podcast, one thing I'm curious is throughout the year of you doing this, what has this podcast taught you, right? What have you learned from it? I mean, just the thought, especially for me, a guy who doesn't often branch out and isn't always great at those relationships of sitting down weekly and just interviewing people about their story. I imagine that has to be transformative in some way. What has it been like for you? Well, it's, it's been learning from friends. But um, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah. that took oh. me a while to actually come up with that name. I know it sounds really strange, but I kept looking at dona- domain names and like, oh, is this one taken? Is this not? Oh, names are important. You yeah. you want it to feel right. It's completely understandable. But I I will say humility, humbleness. That's like the two biggest things. There's so many more, which I'll I'll say here in a second. But that's the first ones that popped up in my mind because someone's giving you a gift of their time to come in there. You want to be respectful of that. You want to listen and hear them out because this is their story. This is Mm -hmm. their gift to you. And if you're not making them feel comfortable, and if you're not making them feel like they're important, they're not gonna open up to you. And that goes a lot, that taught me a lot about myself and taught me more about, as a teacher, how to listen to my kids. And Mm -hmm. yes, I call them my kids, not my students, because of every single one of them, I call them, they're really kind of like my kids. And being able to do that went such a long way and I think a growth of myself into my 30s now, I'm 33, doing this. Now, with this is reconnecting with people that I may have not seen as well for sure years right. or never really knew a lot about them and it allowed me to kind of open up that door again because I've interviewed a couple of friends that I hadn't seen for over a decade. Right. I mean, you can sit down and have a sit down hour long conversation with someone that you might have never had oh, yeah, an hour long conversation with. Right? I've talked to teachers that I, I really hadn't seen in a long time. I reconnected with a friend that I knew in 4-H many years ago. And I mean, there's it's just been amazing when I reach out to someone, their willingness to be able to come on and discuss something. And that makes you more of a again, listener, more than a talker, because we know I love to talk. That's <laughs> my name. I love to talk. Well, that makes two of us. So <laughs> I can't throw any stones on that one. And, and, and it takes the time for like the patience to be able to place the right question. Mm. That timing that brings out really how can you bring that best out in an individual? Sure. So doing that has just, I mean, it's nuts to be able to think that that's kind of out there to be able to bring people a little closer together. And I've had some emails that have come in from people that have been other parts of the world that like literally other parts of the world from my student that one of my students reached out to me and goes, hey, I found your podcast. This was really cool to kind of think about that. Maybe I wanna come on your podcast one day and so again, reconnecting. It's so just that humbling, mm-hmm. come back to that humbleness and that humility of, wow, I never thought this could impact somebody sure. or this could change my thought process about event as well, because if I get to peek behind your eyes for a moment, I get to walk Absolutely. in your shoes for a second. Yeah, because I think when you say that, even if you just did this for yourself and like no one listened, right? The fact that you're having these conversations with people where they're often vulnerable, right? They're like they're so they're willing to to bear a bit of their soul. To have that sit sit in front of you, that has to be an informative experience, right? I don't know how that wouldn't yeah. change you in, in so far as how you approach conversations or talk with people or just think about how everyone has their own story and how much deeper it goes. Like here's one that's relatable to you is I got your brother to come on the podcast. That's true. Yeah, that's true. For anyone that doesn't know, my brother going on a podcast is something that I would never envision within a million years. The fact that that happened was impressive the yeah. fact that you even got him out here to do that and to speak candidly right i mean it was a great podcast episode talking about the university of georgia fandom if you get a chance go back listen to it it's an early episode it's a really good one yeah it's really good yeah wink wink very good you should absolutely no it is it is good yeah. um, shameless advertising shameless in, in any episode all of my episodes are great going absolutely. back there and listen to it because everybody brings something a little different and that's also a cool part of sometimes you don't know what someone's hobby is and you don't know really what they're really passionate about. And then when you're talking about creating an outline, you're like, you want to talk about this? Like I was surprised sure. with one of my friends 
another Chris that came on the podcast and talked he about addiction. He sounds dashing. Oh, he's an amazing yeah, individual. sounds dashing. He mm-hmm. came on the podcast and was willing to talk about addiction. Uh-huh. And as we're recording this, and it's it's so amazing, and I could tell it was therapeutic. Mm, sure. And, and that to me was just like, oh my gosh, I never imagined this beauty that could come out from something that just started as a general conversation. Sure. And I think you make a great point there in that almost everyone can benefit from talking to someone about yes. how they feel. We all have a story inside of us. It's the matter of having someone who listens. Yes, absolutely. And it has to be, I imagine, therapeutic for someone to be able to get it off their chest in what feels like a safe space and an informative, uh, like educational way almost, right? Because there are things that people might be afraid to just sit down and talk about over coffee, right? They might feel like the occasion isn't right for it, but you're giving them a, a location or a spot in which they can do that, right? Yeah, and picking a location, that's another part of that that's been has taught me whenever I'm recording some places that that may make them feel a little more at ease. Mm. Like I've traveled up to Athens. I went sure. down to little parts of South Georgia to be able to record. And I've, I've been, I've done it in a park. I've sat back on my back porch. I mean, it's amazing to think how much an, a location could be, the aesthetic to mm. be able to add something. Sure, like sure. right now in the background, you have your air conditioning running. And I think that's going to be really cool to have in the background because I've been in some locations where we've had trains going through oh, and yeah. we've had some where it's just the crickets, the cicadas, but it adds an element. Mm-hmm. Sure. Like well, hey, yeah. if you wait until 9 p.m. tonight, a train will go by. We also <laughs> have a train. So we're going to need to ex- extend this by about seven hours. OK, so this will be a, that I could do a whole season of just of sitting here at, at that point, you know, <laughs> cut into 30 minute episodes. <laughs> oh, oh you, good idea. Right. Yeah. We, we need to edit this part out so that way they don't know we're oh, about gosh. to pull the wool over Ooh. their eyes. Yeah, and I imagine that this has just made you better dealing with relationships with people, right? Because you're just so much more observant about the little things that make people tick. Yes, yes. Interesting, interesting. So it sounds like you've gained quite a lot from the podcast. Oh, yeah. Stuff I never, ever would have imagined at all. It's just, yeah. I can't even say anything more than just, oh, words. It it doesn't work. and. (laughs) Words, words, words indeed, <laughs> words. right? Words indeed. Well, I'll ask you to say more words, but I'll go in the different direction. What's the hardest part about keeping up with a podcast? Is oh, it, my word. Is it the stuff that people might expect, like editing and timing? Or are there things that you would just never have thought of before you started this that now you're thinking, why is this so hard? There are so many answers to that question that I never knew I would uncover. <laughs> and God bless Every editor, every person that works on movies, works on commercials, doing any sound level stuff, it is a nightmare trying to figure this out. Like I will literally sit at my laptop between two and a half to six hours, sometimes upwards of eight hours editing one podcast. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, and it, it, it all depends upon how someone's like, they speak with their filler words. They may say, um, uh, so many times, or sometimes they wind up saying these words that you're like, well, how, do, how does that work? And clicking in the, uh. little, <gasps> like the little sounds that you have to sit back and pick up every single one, edit it, clean it up to make it sound nicer. And then after that, if their noise levels are too loud, if they're really close to the microphone or they're really far away from the microphone and whispering, you, you've got to be able to figure out how to edit that and as well, learning the equipment here. I have a very basic outlook of how to be able to put this together. I want to keep it minimal as possible, minimalistic as possible. The box that I'm using is probably 10 years old that my brother gave me uh, from whenever he was starting a podcast uh-huh. that there's a whole long story behind that one. But thank you for Corey for giving me that and passing that forward because I know that was a lot to do so. And he gave me one of the first microphones I had. You gave me a mixing set of like how to start a podcast deal. That's right. And that thing was completely trash. It did not work. <laughs> like, it was terrible. Um, and so I a for know, effort, right? It, it, hey, it it had sat in your apartment for probably like four years before you uh, touched God, it. God, more than that, I would say probably. And more then than I had that. to learn how to you know what cables to properly buy. Okay, this cable works. This cable doesn't work. Okay, with the input jacks on it. The there may be a hiss from this, or there may be not a hiss, and it may sound too clean or not enough. Too clean. What a problem to have when it's well, too clean. Think right? about it. If you're talking 
and there's a little bit of like a grunge to the voice and I talk and it's super clean, that mm, contrast back and forth sure. sounds so It, it would weird. be off because of the difference. Exactly. Sure. And that's something that I never thought about. And every time I am, I am so bad with technology. <laughs> oh my God. I, I'm so glad you've said this because the moment that you said, I want to keep it basic, I already knew what I was going to say <laughs> oh, yeah. next. Yeah. Uh, the fact that Kate is doing this podcast should let you know, fair listener, how much he cares about this. Oh, yeah. Because this man's technological oh, skills so bad. are horrific. So now, bad. when I say that, you think, okay, yeah, well, of course. But, you know, a lot of people are bad at technology. I, I mean, let me just paint you a picture. At one point, we were at his house for something. And we were trying to find something. And it happened to be on Twitter or something like that. I believe it was Twitter. And we said, all right, well, okay, go on that person's Twitter page and just find the tweet. And Cade struggled to even stroll, <laughs> scroll down the Twitter page far oh, enough to find the tweet. I'm pretty sure he gave up before he realized that Twitter scrolled. So yeah, probably so. This that man about right. working all this equipment, doing all of this sound mixing, has trouble scrolling down Twitter. So he cares about you by doing this podcast. I want you to know there's a it's lot true. of love and effort that goes into this. And I'm really hoping for this episode not too much effort because as he talks about editing, I've been sitting over here fiddling with the sound mixing the oh, yeah. entire time. And don't forget time. to touch my, my trackpad every so often so it doesn't go to sleep. So it doesn't computer. go to sleep. Yeah, if exactly. you guys hear me choke for a moment, it's because his computer is turned off uh, and then we have a problem. But yeah, so. And that computer is literally 13, no, yeah, 13 years old and still running. Good old MacBook Pros. And so you can't complain with that. Is this the computer you had in college? No, it's not the computer. Okay. I, I bought right. this after college. Literally, pretty much right after college. No, it's not the one that you spilled beer that's, on. That's what I was... <laughs> that one still, still works. I might have almost ruined a portion of one of his computer screens. You um, replaced it, though. Just Very maybe. proud of you. I did. Thank you. Very Thank proud you. of you. I appreciate it. Let the record be shown. I owe no money on this computer <laughs> screen. But yeah, back, back to it. The, the software. Sure. It updates. And... Again, with me being technologically impaired, I'm like, so they're going, oh my gosh, like an update, what do I do? How does this work? Oh my gosh. And just being frustrated at it. Sometimes like I'll literally hand stuff over to my wife and go, Katie, fix this. I don't know what's going on. Oh yeah. And then I'll, I'll go to YouTube and watch like 13 videos, try to figure out what's going on with that. And it's, it's frustrating. I've got a really awesome $150 microphone. For those that have the Blue Yetis, I've got a Yeti Blackout Edition. That is just kicking my butt. I can't figure out how to make it work because all I get is a the whole way through. And that's I, I should have figured this out like six months ago, but I still have the mic and I'm frustrated with and it. And for those that don't know, Yetis are nice microphones. They are I very nice microphones. Okay. It is a very nice microphone. A lot of people use it for podcasting and roundtable discussions. Ah, but I see. Going back into like side tangent there with a the microphone. But again, one of the microphones that you're actually using, Chris, is from your set. So the, oh, other things, so that's kind of cool. amazing. But my podcast set lives on. Exactly. But I, writing an outline is so hard like that's sure. uh, keeping up with the podcast is writing an outline i may have three or four guests in a week because i sometimes record just so much in advance in order to keep up with content and writing a good outline is so hard because i want to research the topic that we're going to talk about whenever they say oh yeah we're going to talk about nuclear energy matt gosh that was so <laughs> over my head like that episode's not out yet but that took me forever to learn more about this if this episode isn't anything but Matt just sitting there talking for an hour and you just nodding along, I'm going to be shocked because I can already envision how that it's one's going to go. It's a great episode, but man, it was so challenging to learn about because we also did it. There's a two part, it's a two part episode. The first one we did is about the other energies like coal and solar and stuff. And I'm trying to research all that as well. And there's some episodes as well that it's, how am I going to be able to pull out the best in this individual of asking a guided question to keep things on track. Mm. And that that's hard, sure, just to, sure. to keep a flow. And I've had some guests that have come on that have literally written a script out of what they're exactly gonna say to a T. Mm. And that was comforting for them, but that it was really nerve wracking for me because I go, it's gonna sound robotic or something like that. But I, it didn't, it sounded right. amazing, but that was what their comfort zone was. But I can imagine for you, the idea of having to follow a script that is just put before you before a podcast, right? Yeah. There's a lot of skepticism for that, right? It's as you true. mentioned, is it going to come out as authentic? And I will, side note, I will say, this is a man that definitely cares for his outlines. I looked at a few to get ready for this episode, and one of them was 12 pages long. 
Yeah. And I said to myself, I can't do that. <laughs> so I think I would fail as a podcast host. I mean, that was, that was an episode that needed a little more extra guidance. Sure, sure. Like, you have to know based on the person. Exactly. Like with your brother's episode, with Robbie's, I sat down and I wanted to ask very specific questions about, okay, I want to go from this person to this person. Mm-hmm. I want you to make sure that you feel comfortable as well. Mm-hmm. Because sure. for Robbie, it, was, it helped out so much. And I could tell he was so more comfortable with that having the questions in advance too. Sure. Because I try sure. to give it to people at least two, three weeks in advance. Uh, sometimes it winds up being one. So they can look at it and say, okay, that's appropriate. I can handle that. Okay, I don't know what that, how to answer that. Um, that doesn't make sense. Let's reword that. And mm, it's sure. kind of like how you put me on like a three-day notice I, of trying to edit this out. I was about to say, honestly, Gosh. Kate says I gave him a three-day notice. That's generous. I'm pretty sure I gave him a one-day, maybe two-day notice. So all that grace he gave everybody else, I did not give no, him he in did return. Not. No, he did not. Like, and I, I have a small, uh, I have the outline in front of me, but I have like bullet points to let me know, okay, I want to hit this. I want to hit that mm, with sure. me talking. And so, and that an outline goes a long way. Right, right, right. I, I can believe it. I can believe it. That that really is the hardest part with keeping up a podcast. I will say that. Gotcha. And now that I've I, this whole summer, I spent recording, gosh, like twice a week, sometimes three times a week, in order to have episodes for in the in the future because I'm in school. It's a little right. harder to record now. So some episodes right. I literally recorded in June or July. That's not going to come out to like probably February. Or January. Right. And it's right, like right, it, right. it's great to have that into place. Yeah. And. Speaking of school, we will talk about that in a moment. We're going to get into to Kate's Ooh, career. Oh but before we do, one last question about the podcast. Where do you see this podcast a year from now? Do you see it at a similar level? Do you envision it changing dramatically? I know from starting off to getting to this year, you know, you said it earlier. You didn't even know if you'd make it a year. No, I didn't. I didn't think I would, right? to be honest with you. So, like, wh- where do you see this podcast going? Is this the exact level you want? Do you think it could change? Will you be stunned if you make it two years? <laughs> That's a big one. Yes, I will be stunned. I will admit, whenever I started this out, my brain was going, I want to do 36, not 36, 26 episodes in one year, every two weeks. Every two weeks That's the goal right. to be able to do. I think I've done like 30 or 40 um, because I, I cut a lot of them into two-part episodes because we uh. went to two hours. Or we went to a, a little over an hour and 40, and I wanted to be able to split into two parts. So I want to keep up with that kind of level of doing more than 26 episodes mm, a year. That production. I right? would you want to keep it high. Exactly. I would love to do an e- a, a weekly podcast at one point. That would be really interesting to do that. But I want to split them into two different ideas. I want to have the one that's like this, that we're sitting here having this kind of discussion that's like an hour long, maybe like, you know, an hour and 30, something like that. Mm-hmm. But I also maybe want to do something on like the artistic side of I write poetry or that I want to have oh. someone maybe come on as a guest in talk kind of like this, like we're doing and turn the microphone on us. So we have a round table discussion. Oh, like I've been wanting to do finally do a wrestling episode where there's about six of us talking about professional wrestling because that's our passion. That would be cool to do something like that and maybe turn over to, I did a lot of topical stuff this year with people with their hobbies, people with their jobs. And I did have a couple of episodes that were very like personal and intimate of their stories, but maybe actually focus more to that of letting mm. them tell more of like a life story I see. Uh, or an event that specifically focusing in on that. Maybe that would be something that would be really kind of cool to see it evolve in that direction. Cause that was the original idea. That gotcha. was the original idea just to kind of go that. I and see. then it's just kind of flop back and forth and, I only have so many friends. Let's be honest here. <laughs> I've got a lot of friends. but that, like, Eventually, you will not be able to learn yeah, from your friends. It, exactly. So you learned all that you can. Yeah. But I'm, so I'm going to bring some guests back and, and kind of give an update. Like, you know, see how life has changed, exactly. right? I it, mean, everybody loves a, a sequel, you know? Your book's going to eventually get published. Someday. And so We're I'm going to be doing this podcast on. when you're 50 then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a friend that we interviewed earlier, Daniel Welker, who I want to have come back on because he got a uh, job right. in... I'm trying to remember where it was. I think it's Phoenix City, Alabama. And I want to give the update of, hey, look where he is right now. Sure. And then maybe go back to a couple other people just to kind of see what's happening with them in that update or maybe go a totally different direction with their episode. Gotcha. I see. I see. Why not? Sure. That could be, that's kind of the direction of it. 
I, I, I hope this makes it <laughs> to, to year two. I, I really does. And maybe we could sit back and do something similar to this. In, right. See, in, see where we're yeah. at, right? I mean, I'll be, I don't know, a flamingo dancer, or, you know, working Ooh. on a new career on the side, something like neat. that. I mean, that seems totally probable. Side note, I will say if we do a group round table discussion, we're definitely going to need to do a trial run because oh, anyone totally. that knows us and our friends, if you get us talking, it's just going to be an hour of six voices just blabbering incessantly. You're going to understand four words that comes out of that podcast. So you're going to have to say, okay, you have the magic conch shell right now. You can speak. Here's the, here's the speaking stick. Ooh, dude, like, magic conch. No, that's yeah, it. That's, that's, that's how you do it. Yeah, magic that's, conch. We're going to have to do that. We're, we're literally going to have to because if everyone has a different opinion, everyone has a different mindset of, I, my opinion is right. Or no, this is really interesting. This is what's going to happen. Sure. Because we've been watching it since we were kids. Yeah, yeah. Or like, anything. If we talk yeah. about anything, I think we could talk about our favorite kinds of bread and we'd probably get into a... Uh, Argument. <laughs> where <laughs> our words are no longer <laughs> tangible to uh, to our fair listeners. But that's fantastic. They're my listeners, Chris. Oh, They're yeah, yeah. Ears. Right, right, right. See, Wait, I'm already slowly to, going to, to assimilate it? into to this. Trying to steal my podcast? Right? This is Chris Bias with... His learning from friends, right? Yeah, pretty soon you guys are just going to be permanently. You're Maybe say, I'll Kate have who? guest hosts. Maybe I'll have where someone hosts and talks to another person and kind of have, oh. See, I like that idea. Ooh. I will say your anxiety is going to go through the roof oh, it on totally that. Would. It'll go through it the totally roof would. for sure. So I'm I turning think, over my baby. This was hard to turn over my baby yeah. to you at this point. You need to wait until you're absolutely desperate before you do that. Guys, I don't know if I call it desperate. It comes down to like the trust factor of like, do I trust that person? Okay, See, I he's, trust you to do he's it. saying trust. I'm going to say desperate. When you hear different guest hosts, you know Kate is clutching at straws. He's run out <laughs> of friends. All right. His, his friends are gone. But uh, it, it, in the threat of dwelling for so long on all of our podcast thoughts and desires, Fair play. people may not believe this, but this is not how you make a career, right? <gasps> you are not oh, no. rolling in the podcast dough. You, sir... Uh, to make ends meet are a teacher. I am. And I've I've mentioned that in the background several times of the podcast, but you're going to get into the nitty gritty here of this on it. But yeah, if I have any of my students listening, do your homework, like <laughs> study for your test. Come on. You, we can do this. That Let's have a discussion in class. Like that's, let's go with it. And former students, come on, visit me. Send me an email. I kind of reach out in that sense. I, I love hearing from my students. And we have a couple of my students from last year. They'll come down and it's like, I'm like, how did you get here from the eighth grade hall? There's like four people watching. Oh, oh I, I just, I kind of went this round way. And I'm like, you just got to applaud, applaud him at you. that point, like, right? I, I applaud you. just you. got to say, well done. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I, I, I teach. Well, like, what, and, what kind of teacher are you? Let the people know. I'm a strict militant. You walk into my classroom. I mean, I meant more like, oh, oh, what grade okay. are your purpose, oh, right? Okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, militant <laughs> too and all that. That's great. Um, no, um, I've taught a wide variety of things over the years i will admit, okay started out you know substitute teaching trying to find a job that first half and then i wound up getting a job working in a emotional behavior disorder classroom with your brother uh for for literally for half a school year i completely forgot about yeah. that until and this very moment then at the end of that school year i didn't have a job lined up and my wife and i were trying to find a place to be near each other because she was living in ohio i was here we kept looking around we trying to find work in similar locations, I was interviewing in Ohio, we interviewed in North Carolina, and we wound up landing in South Carolina, which was a completely horrific experience uh, right. for me. I'm not going to go into that detail, right. uh, just because that's, I mean, traumatic uh, entirely. I came back and I subbed for the remainder of the school year because I only made a half a year in South Carolina. And the next year, I got a job working at a school for students that had behavioral issues or in psychological issues in order to like mm, kind of help them out. And I did that for, I think, three or four years. And then I kept getting injured. <laughs> I literally just kept getting injured. I had my jaw cracked, my nose fractured, my esophagus, like not cracked, but some kind of an issue to it. C4 and C5 partially herniated my neck. School I School battle wounds. Yeah, I got like goodness, a sty in my eye from getting spit on. I mean, I love those kids. I love the atmosphere. It was special education, and that's a big passion of mine. And I did that. And eventually they're like, Kate, you've been just getting hurt too much, so you need to kind of move on and go somewhere else. We're not saying it directly, but we're, we're, we're kind of like hinting at it. I have to say the fact that as in demand as teachers are, and especially those robust enough to deal with, you know, special education or more difficult situations, 
the fact that you got hurt often enough <laughs> that the people that ran the school were like, no, really, you need to move on shows how concerned they were for your health. I was a pair pro though. Like as a pair pro, as a pair professional, mm. I wasn't a lead teacher. I was kind of like just an assistant in the classroom helping out with those students in kind of a smaller kind sure. of role. Sure. So I was making the basically half of what the teacher was making. While and, getting while getting beat your up. esophagus but, crushed. Yeah, yeah exactly. It seems like a portrait. Um, it was actually, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was very, again, another humbling experience. See, this man's a saint, if you didn't realize it. I just said that it wasn't fair that he got paid half and got his esophagus crushed, and he was down with it. Yeah. Like, he was he was ready to roll with it. Does that make me a masochist? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> saint. We're going to yeah. go with saint, okay? okay. okay? And then I worked in um, as a one-on-one para pro for a little while. I worked as a one-on-one para pro because I still wasn't ready to go back and be a teacher. I just wasn't ready. I didn't feel comfortable to do it. Sure. I got into another classroom with working with a teacher of uh, still being a one-on-one. -on -one. This is my second year with that one-on-one -on -one student. And the teacher in the classroom goes, Kate, you're beyond ready. Like, I don't have to tell you what to do. You're already doing it in the classroom. You're beyond comfortable. Leave. Like, not trying to say leave, get out of my classroom, but leave. Like A supportive leave. Yeah, like go. A gentle get out a of here. A job opened up in, at an elementary school for the remainder of a school year. Pandemic hit, I only made it like a month oh, and a half of that school. I remember this, yes. And I went through the job, loved it, and was having a blast working with, I had a kindergartner, I had a third grader, and I had a fifth grader, fifth graders bunch that I was working with, and then pandemic hit. And the school was losing a large number of those kids, so my job allotment went away. I and, remember when that yeah. happened thinking, this is not fair. <laughs> you finally yeah. got that job. I was so happy thought, there too. Yes, this is it. And then it was like the universe was like, nope, not nope. for you. And I started back the school year as a pair program because of jobs, were, we didn't know what was going on with the pandemic. We didn't sure, know if there would right, be right, right. A l smaller amounts of Everything jobs. Everything was in flux. People were going to go digital, what was going on. Right. In less than a month of being in a school, they needed a digital, they, they was like, we need digital teachers, blah, 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 blah. And my principal, gosh, I love my principal so much. He's helped me out, get so many different jobs. And shout then out brings to the me back. Principal, shout yeah. out to the principal. And then brings me back all the time for it. So That's amazing. And I started working the digital for for a year. And that was amazing. The end of the year, the job went away again. Um, oh. It went away because they were dissolving that program because we had the kids who were going back to the classroom instead of being digital. Right, right. My principal calls me up again and goes, I got a job teaching English. Kate should not be teaching English. <laughs> this is th that was a terrible idea of being able to teach English. Just I mean, I was like, N okay. And he goes, trust me, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. Partway, like literally less than a couple weeks being in the school, he goes, I'm going to move you to study skills, teaching the digital kids that we have there that are because we're housing our own digital kids. I see. And little did I know, he had a plan of, I'm going to move you to social studies. We have a teacher retiring. Oh. And. But I couldn't right say anything. I didn't know what was going on. I, yep. I couldn't say I didn't know anything in quotation marks. And I moved in the position. I've been there for now. It's been officially a year. I taught last year, came in right before and that. And social studies is what you wanted to be That is my be peanut in. butter and yeah. jelly. Yeah, yeah that's like, fantastic. I I'm no, so happy. I had no clue you had such a cool principal. Yeah. All right, let's go, principal. Seventh grade social studies yeah. teaching middle, uh, the Middle East, uh, Asia proper, and Africa. Like, that's what I'm doing. And... So I, I want to leave the world, like getting back to your question, why did you decide to teach? I went on a soul tight side, side tangent there of I gave you a little bit of my history. No, no, but it's great. I want to leave the world a better place than I found it. Like I really do. I saw my mom teaching growing up because that's what she did for, I believe it was 36. You're going to correct me and say it was 38, or but I think it was 36. She's shouting at the, <laughs> totally is. the phone right my now. My mom is, and my dad are like my number one listeners. They listen to like every podcast, like the day it comes out, like shout out to mom and dad. Like, Woo. <laughs> but I, I, I saw that and she, cause she was always there for us. Whenever mm, we did an sure. event, like my dad worked night shift for a while and for him being able to be at things was harder because he needed to sleep during the day. Mm -hmm. And my mom was always, you know, I'm going to take you to practice here. I'm going to take Corey to go do this. I'm going to take Chelsea to go do that. Sure. And so she was constantly around having to pull all these different strings. And dad was always up. And gosh, I don't know how he pulled off sleeping like three, four hours and, and doing stuff with this and then going to work. Like that's, I would die. Yeah, yeah, I would die. It was amazing. Like, I don't know how my dad did that. And that was a big thing as well. It, be there. And so mm, sure. I had, I wanted to learn. I love to learn. I love to be able to share my knowledge. And my dad was always that way as well. And my mom was And one day. I remember like helping someone in high school and I saw that aha moment, that look that someone's wheels was turning and they got it. Ah, and that to I me see. was so addicting. Ah, so you're addicted. Yeah, I got it. I'm addicted, addicted to, to education, to teaching? education. See yeah. everyone. When I said this man was a saint earlier, right? 
He's addicted to educating. <laughs> I mean, if that isn't a saint, I don't yeah. know what is. It totally, it, it's it's confusing. And I try to battle it. My mom always said, like, don't become an educator. Don't go into education. Do something else. Do this. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do this. Like, whatever. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm with you, mom. I'm not going to do this. Anyone I went, that's a son or a daughter of a yeah. teacher is told that the yeah. entirety of their lives. We are. The yeah. entirety of our lives. It's not. It's a thankless job. Like, it totally is at yeah. times. It is It's so rewarding, though. Like, I love teaching. Like, I'm not saying taking a pay cut here on this, but like I give up a lot of my paycheck to my kids and being able to make sure they got their supplies, make sure they've got food, make sure stuff's in the classroom. But it's that real building that relationship with somebody is just so important to me as we've mentioned in the podcast. Sure, sure. But um, it's, I went to college. I was not knowing what I was doing. I was Georgia Highlands. And all of a sudden I, there was, I had to have like one more credit or something before I went to the University of Georgia uh, that I was trying to get there. And they're like, take an education class. Oh, mistake that was that was where like i got <laughs> oh, i got, I got drawn in. in and then they somehow found out programs. you were the son of a teacher and yeah. they're like just get this guy to take a single education <laughs> class and he's gonna be hooked yeah right? instead of the uh, the the son of a was it the daughter of a preacher man instead of a preacher man like what was that song like i was the son of a teacher man like oh my you know, God. teacher woman if, like, uh, not know. to make this about me but i am the son of a a preacher man and a teacher woe man. Yeah. So both of these versions of the song could apply to me. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that it, it, the rest is kind of history. And I started looking at programs, and there was two schools that had a secondary social studies education program mm -hmm. in the state. I applied I for both, got into both of them. And Garrison had went to University of Georgia. You were heading to the University Garrison. of Georgia. And I was like, I, I got to go, especially because I am a music fiend. I love music. And yes. Athens is a Avent music scene. So foreshadowing like, of the next topic. How totally convenient. <laughs> how totally. convenient. Though I did want to ask before we did move on, how long have you been teaching officially then? Oh man, 2001. So this is year 11, but it's been so many different jobs. I assume you mean 2011. Right? Did I say 21? What did I say? 2001. 2011, you're right. Yeah. Kate, Kate has yeah. not been teaching since he was in the third, fourth grade. Yeah, <laughs> Let's clarify. Yeah, uh, 2011, that, that was the, the year it started. Okay. And Long last years, year yeah. was the first ever renewable contract I got. Ever. 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 My Out of, and that God. is that is the normal thing of you get a renewable contract every year. That was my first year ever getting a renewable contract. This man worked a decade just yeah. to get his first, renewable, get my contract. first renewable contract. Send him your, I don't know, Christmas donations or something, right? I know he doesn't want yeah. those. I know he does not want you to do that, but, you know. Well, I'm going to give him a plug. A if you basket. want to uh, donate to the uh, Patreon page for Learning From Friends podcast, I'll, you know, take your donations oh, here. Oh, perfect. You know? I, I didn't know there was a Patreon yeah, there's page. there's a Patreon page. That's lovely. Yeah, yeah go do it. This yeah. guy puts in a lot of work to bring yeah. you these stories. Yeah, help him out. Now, one thing he did mention, he mentioned music. So far, you guys have heard about Cade, the astute podcast host, the selfless teacher, but Cade, a little bit of a wild side. Cade was in a band. Oh, oh, Cade. In fact, it's no longer the introductory music, but the music that used to open this podcast was created by a band that he was in, The Paper Trails. You are a bassist, my friend, and you weren't in just a band that only played by themselves. I went to some of your shows. That was right? fun. Those were good. You were up on stage. Tell us a little bit about that musical uh, dabbling I'm going you to go did. ahead. I got to correct you. It's not the paper trails. It was paper trails. Boom. See, man like, of music, man of music right there. You don't add the. Like there's Noted. <laughs> I, I'll never make a mistake again. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that, was, that was fun. I, I will admit that was a very important and transitional point in my life. Music has always been something that's been there around. Like my mom always had music playing and my dad always had music going on. And I had a plethora of different genres mm. that were around mm -hmm. me like heavily, and I'm gonna give a shout out, my mom's gonna cry because of this one, is my first cousin, Tracy, was big into folk music, jazz and blues, and whenever we would go up to North Carolina, she owned a restaurant, mm -hmm. and she would have all these different acts playing, and she was always just a open person for wanting people to succeed with music, and wanted the live music aspect, and the more I learned about her over the years of, she played music, she wrote music, and all these different things, that. It was so fascinating to me of having that aspect of playing music live and, and being a musician in general. And Corey took piano lessons, Chelsea took a lesson or two and, you know, <laughs> stopped on that. And so, and my mom played piano mm, in, in uh, organ at our church. She mostly played organ, but every so often she'd fill in piano. 
And my dad sang, my dad had an amazing voice, still does, but he doesn't sing as often as he used to. And my mom doesn't play piano at church or organ that much anymore at church. Every so often, like she'll get called up and she'll do it. But that was always there. And it all changed when my friend Bobby, another member that's been on the podcast, Matt will be on the podcast later, uh, but he started playing guitar. And we had been into boy bands and all this ever different kind of like pop music and everything. I'm sure and we had NSYNC, Blair, oh, and Hanson. Yes. Backstreet oh, yeah. Boys was always my jam. See, I, I was an NSYNC you. man. I was you NSYNC. were an NSYNC guy. I was NSYNC. Oh, interesting. I mean, now you know that Cade's wrong about something, picking NSYNC <laughs> over the Backstreet Boys. You've seen his flaws, podcast crew. Yeah, it's, it's true. But Corey, this is where Corey, again, you get props and, and taking things away from me all the time. But this is the big prop here of like, you changed our music taste forever. Whenever you start introducing us bands like Sonic Youth and all these other just different types of rock and roll music that I think I you're making really your brother's into. day right now. Like, He's patting himself on the back listening he, to this podcast totally, right now. He totally did. Like he made it in that transition just over, to, and especially Bobby transitioned him over to want to play guitar. And he picked up and became this amazing musician and playing all this, this stuff. And he goes, well, we need to start a band. And I'm already over there hanging out with him a lot because we were just two goofballs anyway and lived near each other. And so he goes here, play bass. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm like, pluck it along, have no idea what's going on. And the first song I learned to play was Days of Confused, which is basically just walking down. Oh man, how and appropriate. Like, you, Days of Confused, learning yeah. how to play Days of Confused. Yeah, from Led Zeppelin, go Led Zeppelin. And it kind of, we we had, there's been many evolutions of the band over the year. It was started out as Booze Hound, which was us and yes. Taylor on drums. And we all had no idea what was going on. And we were, it was a mixture of like, Hendrix and Nirvana and all this stuff kind of but going played together. played at like an eighth grade level. Yeah, right? like eighth, ninth grade level. Because we, yeah, we started playing in seventh grade. Like seventh grade. I knew it was, was around middle school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it became uh, Karma Gia. Karma Gia. Like, it became Karma Gia. We had a, a member from another band that we like loved his music. It was, that's a whole weird long story there. Yeah, with that. side story. You know, bands, yeah. drama, members, how yep, things exactly. like that go. His band broke up because the drummer moved in. So we absorbed him and we started this band and it was, it was cool. We were having fun with it. And then it got like really weird. Um, and that band went away and we like, okay, we can no longer be Karma Gia. We got to become something else. We went through so many drummers at that time. We decided, okay, we're going to become another band, but we couldn't figure out a name and it became Paper Trails. And we kept going through maybe one or two more drummers. Then Matt pops up and that was the, that, that was the click. That was the click. And gosh, I can't remember how many songs we like recorded on like these weird little like mixing boards on different computers and stuff. And a lot of them sounded pretty terrible. And there's a lot of hissing and everything. But gosh, that is just like I love popping on those songs and just listening and just sure. jamming out on that. It, it, that was an important thing to me. I would just I'm a I follow like somebody. Somebody plays, I'll just follow along with them, have fun, let them do the third thing, and just play my simple little bass line in the background. But that changed my life doing that. I, I will admit that. That opened the doors to so many different types of music. My first concert, Corey, thank you so much for doing this. My first concert was one, which was Billy Corgan had just left Smashing Pumpkins. They hadn't really done uh, many other projects. They didn't know what was going on. And he pops up with this band. Corey's in college and he brings me home this CD and goes, hey, like, look, this is Zwan. And they're going to be playing a show at the Tabernacle in like a couple of like, I think it was like a couple of months and do you want to go? And I'm like, I'm, I think I'm in middle school at this time, maybe early high school. You're blurring Hanson in the background <laughs> as Corey, you're mm bopping, right? <laughs> While Corey is pitching this weird band to you. No, mm -hmm. and I was in cause I already liked Smashing Pumpkins. I already, I knew I liked Smashing Pumpkins. They had, and it was super cool. That I already had had that connection in, I believe it was eighth grade. Maybe it was ninth grade. I keep all my ticket stubs from bands, concerts. So I'll, I'll go back. And if look. I did that, I'd have like seven ticket stubs you because I've been, to, and four of them would be yours. <laughs> <laughs> four of them would be paper trails. We had, concerts. we had, we had paper stubs. I think they were more like no, rip no, off. No. Like we, there were no stubs. <laughs> there is no. Evidence. You had like a ticket ripped in half that maybe was something that 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 had like you know those ones that you get from like raffles. Yeah, if maybe we got lucky. Those, yeah, you're right. One of those generic like dollar store tickets. Yeah, but yeah, right. we went to that show in feeling that bass drum hitting your chest, just feeling that. And then seeing these musicians playing so much together was insane. And then also we went to see Sonic Youth, one of my favorite bands of all time. And seeing this noise and all this chaos just being pieced together, I was like, I want to do this. Like, I, I need this in my life. And it just continued. I so see. it blossomed with music, just kept blossoming, kept finding new bands, kept finding all this different stuff. And 
I mean, and I will say this, another downside of Corey, I'm sorry, you gotta just, I'm gonna oh, just, you, we, all this episode. We've him up too we, much this episode. We yeah, gotta bring we him gotta down bring a little it back bit down. right now. Corey, yeah. Corey taught me how to download illegal music. Like, it, <laughs> okay, like, so so Corey, many Corey, of your later troubles <laughs> are due to Corey's influence. Corey found Napster and, you know, did Napster and I got a couple like things from that. Hey, and in fairness it, to Corey, yeah. anybody our age, <laughs> Learned how to download illegal L- music. LimeWire or was it LimeWire oh, or LiveWire? LimeWire. LimeWire. Yeah. There was LimeWire. Destroy your computer just to get like <laughs> 17 songs and, or and, something And like then that. it became, I can't remember, there was a whole long list. Then it became Pirate Bay. That was the downfall. I went so deep into in Pirate, Pirate Bay. And we got high speed internet. You sail the high seas <gasps> way too just often. Way gigs, too often. Gigs. It, it got into heavy, bad areas where I was just downloading so many at a, at a time. It was oh. I mean, it was so it was so bad going through all that music. But okay, I'm but, gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go backwards. I'm sorry, yeah, I totally no, no, forgot yeah. about we're, this. We're, we're gonna wrap it and break. Yeah, go I, ahead. I forgot about this. I think I said this on a lot on our podcast episode. We had a band. Oh, we, yes, we, we had did. a band. Yes, we, had, we, we did. We had a band. It was called Something with a Hammer. Something with a Hammer. Like, we made it three practices. Yeah, I think that was about it. Yeah, about three practices. What, what you were uh, senior or green tea. Or Dr. Black Tie. No, 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 no. that was easy. It was Dr. Black. Extre- yeah, Mr. Yeti Extreme. Mr. Yeti Extreme was yep. me. You were Senior Green Tea, and Z Wigs, one Dr. of our Black close tie. friends, was Mr. Black Tie. Was, no, I Dude. thought it was Doctor. No, nah, I wasn't Doctor. Okay. Yeah, not Doctor. Yeah. We had to bring that back to that. It was important. Which, which, ironic in that, we only played like, you know, three practices, and we got some old drum set mm. for like 50 or 100 bucks from someone. Oh, it was actually one of the Paper Trails drums. I mean, uh, Karma Gia in uh, drum sets. Oh, okay. It was. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And, Drums have always been on my mind. So up until a few months ago, I really considered getting a drum set and just banging on it in my upstairs room. Um, but, you know, sometimes you don't have money to spend on a drum set. So I haven't done it yet. But maybe a year from now, if we do another episode, it's going to be us talking about our wildly successful band with your prodigy you drummer go. who has learned to play ever long within a year. Right. That's what's going to happen. And I'll lift Corey back up again for a moment. I'm going to lift him back up. We'll, we'll drop him back down in a minute. Okay, good, good, good. We lift him back up. I always was putting like, paper balls and like cotton balls and whatever in my ears in order to stop the sound. Cause I'm still partially deaf as a result of right. all this stuff. Right. Corey and mom and them got us the idea of getting musician earplugs. And that saved oh. us so much, like so much hearing loss. That's why and, we're able to have this podcast today. Exactly. And I am not shouting at you across the table. It's true. Right. Because you managed to salvage your ears. And shout out to my dad on this one for he, he bought my first major like big amp, like stack and everything of amps. My dad's like, okay, let's go buy this. And we walk in there and I go, I want that one. And he's like, that's too expensive. And I'm like, I want that one. Well, that's a little expensive. And then, and I found like, no, that one. And it was a ruggedy old like 1970s setup. That Which was means you loved it. Which death. means you thought it was, it was ex- incredible. But it was expensive. And dad goes, okay, that I'll let you buy that one. It was it was still like a little more expensive than one of the other ones, but it was like that <laughs> one. And he, he bought it on and his credit style. card for me. Like he bought it for me on in his credit card and helped me buy that. And then also he drove me to a lot of shows when we were underaged and sure. didn't have driver's license. Like sure. shout out to my dad for super always being encouraging. He would come over and sit at band practices. So like extremely shout out for my dad constantly encouraging me to go forward on playing music. But also being a realist of like, okay, Kate, like you need to go to college, you need to do this. Sure. Like sure. But I mean like the right. voice of reason, I mean Thank you, Dad, like so much for all that. Thank you, Donald. That's yeah. the that's the theme of this one. Yeah. Uh, two things. One, I had no idea. That's how you started bass. That Bobby literally just gave you a bass yep. and said, "Play." It's funny how you fall into things you're going to exactly. do for years on end. In right? the same bass that my first bass that I bought is the same one I play today. Yeah, and I refuse to buy a different one. Like I, I may buy a P bass one day, and I own an upright. That's fine, but I don't. I, I I don't play it that often. I don't think I've touched it in five or six years. It's so it's sitting kind of on my wall, this upright bass. But yeah, that is the same bass. And I beat that thing to heck and back. It still plays just fine. I was just going to ask you about that, actually, to, to kind of wrap up the musical conversation. You still playing bass right now, clearly? You still dabbling a little oh, bit? Oh, yeah. Same bass guitar? Yep. One of the guys that I... Matt, his dad, Matt's dad, John. who was Matt's the former, drummer of Paper Trails, by yeah, the way, sorry, just to yeah. clarify for everyone who's thinking, who is this mysterious <laughs> Matt that has been mentioned for 40 minutes? He'll be coming on the podcast later. Segway. Couple, you know, you'll, you'll learn who Matt is yeah. soon enough. Soon enough. But um, I'm playing with his dad, uh, John. He oh. was actually a guest on the podcast, which was, I think he was actually one of my first two partners. Small world, isn't it? Like that. And I'm so, I'm, I'm playing with him right now. And one of my buddies, Ryan Cherry, who wrote the music for the episode 
that for going forward for season two intro and outro music. And he also wrote the episode before this one, the Halloween episode. He wrote the music for that as well. Shout out Ryan Cherry, another guest on our podcast. Look at this setup. I didn't even know any of this. And we just pulled all this out. I mean, working like a well-oiled machine. I know, right? So so we can expect a single with you on bass in the future, right? (laughs) All right, everybody, you you heard Uh, it here first. You can expect Kate on bass. 100% 100% guaranteed by myself, all right, based on no guarantee whatsoever, <laughs> oh, but we're going to root for it. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> okay, okay. John, John and Ryan are pushing me and doing a good job. That's good, right. good, John and Ryan. Keep doing it. I expect a single. All right, boys, you guys got to keep it up. So just uh, as we get close to wrapping it up here at the end, uh, just a few a few more questions and things that I'm sure have been mentioned but people might not know about. But Kate Curtis is a married man. Oh, man. I yes, mean, I am. I'm a very happily, lovely married man. See, look at that. I didn't even ask him about it. He already went into it. He was ready for it, right? I'm sure you guys might have heard because on occasion he yells out his wife's name in the background of a podcast. Hey, Katie. <laughs> I hope for work. Yeah. yeah, if you've ever wondered when he says, hey, Katie, and you're like, who is this Katie? It is not a roommate or it's a my parent imaginary fan. or my a, imaginary fan my imaginary friend yeah, yeah yeah or or an imaginary friend he's going to make up to put on the podcast when he runs out of real friends it is his That's actual true. wife how long have you been married Cade? seven years this year so and we've been together for we got we started dating in 2011 gotcha and so 11 yeah, years again and we got married in 2015 so yeah i mean that's it's amazing. Think about that. That like I've, is. I've known her for literally a third of my life. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, I mean, love it. This Every man's day. getting emotional over here, by the way. I am, this is a man totally. that loves his wife. I, I, legitimately. I love my wife. <laughs> Shout out to my wife. Hardcore. Hey, Katie, you're at work right now. working at Starbucks and she's in school right now. She's working really hard to become a lab technician. And That's right. One day I'm hoping to convince her to come on. But uh, at the moment, it's been a continual no. <laughs> it'll never happen i'm like okay no see she just needs to be the tease the one that makes the occasional appearance in the background that everyone waits for but they never get to see right those sort of breadcrumbs are, are i'll good. break her down it, it literally took me i think bribe th- her three or five times to ask her out before she actually finally went out with me so just break it down a little bit little walls little okay. walls going back to the history on this uh you two met in ireland oh yeah. did you not they, we were in a program. I'm going to totally say it. I always say the first word wrong all the time. Consortium for Overseas Student Teaching. It's called COST. Consortium. Is Consortium, that what you're going sure. for? Sure. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Again, I mean words sometimes just don't go along. But yeah, we both applied. Ireland was not our first choice. Neither of our first choices were Ireland. And uh, you have to choose three to five countries. And they pick and choose kind of where you're going to go. And we wind up both getting Ireland. There's, I think, six or eight of us inside the country from all different parts of the world. She was at Kent State in Ohio, and I was at the University. Of, ooh, excuse me, the University of Georgia. I made it the whole episode without burping. Dude, you like made that. it the entire yeah. time. We got an hour so, in, and then you just let one riff. Yeah, just let it go. But um, we authentic. Both there. It's an authentic yeah, it's, experience. Yes. Okay. I believe my first was actually first was Switzerland. I think hers was like Germany or somewhere. But we all we both wound up there. After being there for a while, we were like, okay, we knew we were all there, but we never kind of like connected. And at one point, we all were able to, we got a little homesick and all of a sudden we needed somebody like an American kind of connection. We all met up in Killarney Um, and we got up there and there was four of us that were there. No, sorry. There was five of us that were there and four of us really kind of stuck together. I hit her off the bat with her. I knew she's the one. I'm done. Whatever. Like, I can't go any further. We shared, uh, a bunch of us shared like a pepperoni and sweet corn pizza. Uh, She turns on the TV and we find a Bayern Munich game that's going on. And she's like, oh, you're talking a little bit about soccer. And then she turns on some music and I believe it's Flogging Molly. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I'm like, heartbeat's done. 90 miles an hour. Love over peppercorn pizza. Not peppercorn. It was sweet corn. Sweet corn. And pepperoni. Oh, totally different. Yeah. yeah, totally different. Yeah, style yeah. Pizza. and so and it just kind of like stuck. And a couple of uh, we all, the four of us, kept hanging out. And Corey found out when he was coming over to. Uh, we went to England. He made it so hard. I mean, the entire trip of like, oh, you're gonna ask? Oh yeah, Kate. Like blah 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 blah. So like, I, I give Corey some shout out, but also like, screw you, Corey. I'm making like <laughs> making that trip so hard on me. You helped Kate eventually get there, but he did not enjoy the journey. I, I was not ready. There. I was not ready. And we I asked her out several times. She said no, and then eventually she kind of broke her down little by little, like getting her on the podcast little by little. I'm super impressed and, you asked her out multiple times. Oh yeah. I'll say for me as a person, if I asked someone out, they were just like, no. Well, I would just go no. cry in a corner. It was never a no. 
It was just like, ah, I'm not sure. It was. Oh, you yeah. felt some hope there. There I was see. still hope. She kept going along. And eventually, like, we went on a trip to Germany. And that was in Belgium. We went to a Grusloch Festival. And that was where we separated out. And we got home. And I was like, I'm going. Like, we have to continue this. It's so hard to have a relationship long distance. And it's hard to have a relationship at all. <laughs> yes. See example A, uh, me right now. Uh, so kudos to you for making it work long distance. And we did. We talked every night. If not every night, we would some at some point in the day, just for a minute, in order to say, even if it was for like 30 seconds or like five minutes or an hour, we made a point. We will talk every night, see how you're doing, see kind of what's going on. And then in the night, that was about it. And that when we go to bed, that was the way it worked. It didn't matter where we were at. If I was out at a concert, I would step outside and call. Or if we were out doing something with the group, I'd be like, I need to pause for a minute and go call her. And we did. And that was made it work. Yeah, I can definitely vouch for this. I absolutely recall when you first met Katie in Ireland. And there is this like, there's this girl here. I've asked her out. She said no, but I'm going to keep trying. Yep. Kate was determined from the first. And not only that, I knew this was the one pretty early on when yeah. she came over to a bonfire. Yep. Um, we were just having a bonfire get together. And, you know, previously when you're out with the guys, you talk about, you know, bringing girls over and you always say things like, but if we bring in a girl, we got to be ourselves, right? We got to be the <laughs> dudes, you know, oh, we did we're just going to, we're just going to show them who we are. And before Katie pulls up, Kate walks over to all of us, the guys and says, all right, guys, do not screw this up for me. And I thought, oh, he's taking this serious. Yeah. He's legit here. After all that talk, this is the one. And she was. Totally and was. 11 years later, totally was. still going strong. And that was, she still hates me about basically with the first time she met everybody. Well, she met everybody. It was the first trip down to Georgia. And I put like her around like 10 people. And like, you it definitely was, threw in the deep end. She Though, survived. I mean, from my experience, I thought we did a fine job of compromising. We did and until not, the fireworks came into play. Oh, true. Which is probably yeah, yeah. a story for another, another day. day. Yeah, it is. So, last thing I just want to ask you about real quick let people know you're an auctioneer. Oh, yes. You're a I man am. of many talents. I am. I'm all over the place. I Again, master of none, curious of many. Yeah, I was at a transition point in my career when I got back from South Carolina, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And so I decided, I, I knew auctioneering. I knew a little bit about it because of, there was a cattle barn and a horse barn for, that was selling a horse that we used to go to from time to time. I have cattle. So I used to kind of growing up with that. I decided to go to the North Georgia School of Auctioneering. Thank you, uh, Charlie Gay and Robin Huff. My, Robin Huff is my auctioneer mama, so uh, shout out to you. Shout out you, to auctioneer mama. Exactly. Yeah. Um, as soon as I got out, I got a phone call from George Franco, who is the good news auctioneer. So uh, shout out to to George, who was on the podcast earlier. Man, shout out previous on my guest, plugging all my episodes. Small world. But uh, And so he called, and I went and worked for him. And you know, a couple like months later, he calls me again. Hey, can you come work for me again? A couple of weeks later, come work for me again. And I think we're now going on five or six years ourselves by doing that. Maybe seven, actually. It could be because of we. Excellent. Yeah. And we keep kind of going that way. And so I've, the benefit world is where I, that's my passion. I got a real estate license. And I did uh, real estate for a little while and it was cool. I enjoyed it. But with John Dixon Associates, shout out to John Dixon Associates. If you ever want to sell an uh, auction uh, off your real estate, do so. Great company, great family run business. Oh, look at this. Here comes the pitch. He's doing this out of the kindness of his heart, by the way. We're yeah. not even sponsored for no, this. No. I mean, so excellent. if you want to reach out and they'll, they'll really take care of you excellent. on that. But yeah, that's, that's kind of my auctioneer story, but I, I benefit fundraiser auction. That's my jam. If I can be able to raise money for an organization that needs it and can go a long way, but be entertaining at the same time, that's where I'm at. And I love being a bid spotter. Auction, like getting up there and bid calling is fun, but being a bid spotter, I'm out in the crowd and like hyping everybody out, being a hype man. You being out in the crowd like, hyping people up, I can't so imagine fun. it, sir. That I have seems the, crazy. To I have me. the moniker of a uh, Dancy Boy. Dancy that's, that's, Boy. That's my nickname. Ah. So, and we get phone calls back, and George is like, they want Dancy Boy. And I'm like, okay. So, as you fair listeners are hearing, this is a man that only wants to do auctions for a good cause. He's a teacher and he cares about relationships. Again, if there isn't a saint that is worthy <laughs> of a donation to his Patreon page, then I don't know who is. Look at you. Plug in, plug in for that. I, I'm do, ready do for this podcast. Do you want a gig? percentage? Honestly, it'd be appreciated. It'd be appreciated. We, we can talk about that off air. Um, just to wrap it up here as yeah. we approach the end. Kate, any further thoughts? Oh, Topics, my gosh. Things you'd like to end on? I will say that 
everyone, I've said these throughout the episode, but I gotta, I gotta come back to it. Everyone has a story to, to share. Everyone has one. And something that a goal for me in the future that I would like to be able to do is set up a, not necessarily have to be a business or it could be more of like a service or just something enjoyable where people literally go out to like these retirement homes or retirement communities or into areas that an older community where people can, that may have not been talked to before, may have not had their story mm, I see. told before because they're bottled up and no one's ever asked to hear it. No one's ever asked to hear it. And they may, they may have never said it because of they've never been engaged. Sure. And I want that to become something for you, the guest of, ask a family member something that's going on. You may be surprised at what you uncover. And you may also make a new friend out of that. Someone has a story inside you, being that curious person, like just being curious, being open-minded to the possibility that something traumatic may have happened to them and you're giving them that good day. You smiled at them, you acknowledged them, you made them feel like something important because of we are the experts of our own lives because we experience sure. it. No one Absolutely. else experiences that. Mm -hmm. And it's important to make those friendships, make those bonds, and not be judgmental about it at times. Sure. Because that's, that's what we need as people. We need to connect. We need to be considered cherished. We need to be loved and feel loved and feel like you have something of a purpose because that's how we continue on. If not, you're going to be a crazy, bitter old person. And no one needs no one needs it. No one wants to be that person. No one ever wants to grow up and say, I plan on being a bitter old man in the back corner yelling, get right. off my lawn. It's not optimal and, for no, certain. It's not. But be present. Be wherever you are at that moment. That, that's really, that's the last thing that I would want to say of like advice to anybody, for, especially for this podcast, because that's why this podcast, this is why learning that, from that, friends exists. That's why it exists in the first place, right? Yeah. Well, man, if there is a better way to end a podcast, I don't know it. Cade, how can people find you? They can locate me on Facebook, Learning From Friends. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Learning From Friends Podcast. I have, have a Patreon page. They can be able to go through and send messages or donate. I don't care if you donate a dollar. I don't care if you donate $5,000. If you donate $5,000, I will show up at your house and like shake your hand and like, we'll go out for dinner and everything. Yeah. Like, he says he doesn't care. He would care very much yeah, in a very, very appreciative much. way. Oh my gosh, that's insane. I don't do tier levels just because I'm a teacher. I don't have time to really go through and do all the different stuff. Maybe one day I'll get there. Um, we'll see where that kind of goes. And the last way to be able to really reach out is my email, which is Cade, spelled C-A-D-E, at learning from friends. Dot com. I have a website as well, which is learningfromfriends.com. You can be able to send a message that way if you don't feel like typing out the 30,000 characters of learningfromfriends.com. So that, that's really the, the ways to reach me. That, that's out there. I'm, I'm an open book for the most part to be able to kind of help out. Perfect. Well, I think that about wraps it up. This has been your temporary host, Chris Bias. Next week, Cade is returning to the hosting seat. And you get to hear his lovely questions once again. Cade, send us home. Well, as you know, today it's a special occasion of the one-year anniversary of Learning From Friends. And before we leave, my name is Cade Curtis. Today, your guest on Learning From Friends. Don't forget, let your curiosity fly high.